Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our uh, pre-performance discussion. Uh, my name is Emanuela Bacola and I'm an associate professor here at the University of Warwick, the Department of uh, Classics and Ancient History. Um, and I have the enormous delight to uh, welcome this uh, evening uh, Professor Toth Marshall from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, now, if you are wondering, uh, <laughs> did we actually fly uh, Professor Marshall all the way for the frogs? I'm sure he would be, he would be, you know, he he would be very happy to to do that. But uh, Professor uh, Marshall is now on research leave in Europe, um, and he's writing a book on the frogs. Um, he this is his fourth book. Uh, he has published. Uh, uh, it's the fourth book, no? He has published already on tragedy and comedy um, uh, books that are very significant. They change significantly our view of, of Greek drama, especially in regards um, to, the, um, to the importance of performance and, and staging. And for me, this is actually one of the main reasons why I'm so happy that um, uh, Professor Marshall is here. So now, um, we don't want you only uh, to hear our voice uh, tonight, so we would genuinely like this to be a discussion. Um, so um, I'll call you Toph, okay? Uh, uh, so Toph and I um, have decided to kick off with um, um, a one, each one of us mentioning one thing that we consider particularly significant about you know the frogs um, and then you know um, hopefully this will spark ideas and we will open the the floor for questions um, so uh, shall we start with with top then okay well thank you very much thank you very much for inviting me and I'm thrilled to be here tonight um, I love the frogs I've loved the frogs for many years and I'm always excited to see a production about it I find it hard to get into the mindset of someone in 405 BC. I try, and my job is to do that, but Athens was in a dark place. Athens had been in a war, the Peloponnesian War since 431. Um, it had suffered the, the democracy, the thing that we prize most about Athens had been overturned six years before. There'd been an oligarchic coup in Athens, and I think it's really hard for us to imagine in our privileged lifestyle in the 21st century, how dark a place Athens was in 405. Uh, I'm gonna touch briefly just on something that had happened the year before. In 406, Athens had finally, finally won a sea battle. The Athenian army hadn't been doing so well, and since uh, the what we have to call the disastrous Sicilian expedition, for it, we can't use we can't refer to it without calling it disastrous. Since 415, all they had done, Athens, who had built its strength on the navy, had been losing at sea, and then they finally won. But things went wrong. In their victory at Agispotami, uh, they. Uh, uh, sorry, at Arganusi, um, they, they, at the Battle of Arganusi, they had won, but ships had been lost and sailors had drowned. And so they came back not victorious, but the citizens were furious at the generals who had uh, led the battle, even though it was a victory, because they hadn't rescued the drowning sailors. And as a result, within months, the generals were either sentenced to death or sentenced to exile. The ability of the population to turn on their leadership at this point in time after one oligarchic coup um, shows just how fragile the democracy in fact is. And I know that I'm speaking in Breton months before Brexit right now. And I'm not being funny about that. Athens was dark. They were turning on their leaders. They were killing their leaders. And into that, Aristophanes writes a comedy. And it's a play about playwriting. It's a comedy about tragedy. But it's also a comedy about how to deal with politics. 
Do you believe that theater can actually change your country? I think a lot of people want to believe that, but we haven't had that opportunity very often. Do you believe that comedy can actually change what goes on in the Houses of Parliament? And I think most of us don't believe that. But Aristophanes, rightly or wrongly, trusted in the vehicle of the public performance of poetry. So when Emmanuel and I were talking earlier on today, the homework we assigned for each other in the afternoon was to come up with things that we wanted to convey to you about this play. What stands out most for me is that Aristophanes fundamentally believed that this play that you're going to be seeing tonight might change things. And the sad thing is, he was wrong. <laughs> there was another oligarchic coup. And within months of this play going on, the 30 tyrants, the, the oligarchy of the 30, took over, and within a period of eight months, 5% of the population, the, civic, the citizen population, 5%, so that's you guys, <laughs> are killed. Yeah, <laughs> could have been them. It was an arbitrary choice, that was my point. But the thought of living in a country where within months, five, I don't believe that of Canada, I don't think within a period of time 5% of my country might go, but that was the reality of Athens. And whenever we, you know, we know they've been fighting for 25 years or however long, but recognizing how fragile democracy was, how fragile citizenship was, every time we talk about death, going to the underworld, or the value of citizenship or the public performance of poetry. That's what Aristophanes cares about, and that, for me, is what stands out most about the frogs. Okay, excellent, because it actually gives me um, a very good springboard to kind of start as well. So, um, what uh, for me stands out in this play is exactly what you said, the hope for regeneration and change. Um, so we are very much in agreement with that. But I would also like to, um, um, beyond you know, the, the context, the political and historical context that you know, uh, Toff uh, mentioned, um, I would also like to try to put you in uh, the, the, the dramatic context uh, of, of the play. So this is a play about the god of the theater, Dionysus, going to the underworld um, in order to bring out the poet that will regenerate Athens. Okay? The beginning of the play is about the sterility, um, the cultural sterility, and um, we see also that sterility and death and decay in so many other ways. The cultural sterility of, um, um, of Athens uh, in the beginning. Um, so we have Dionysus going on a journey, so undergoing a journey. And a journey is very often a wonderful metaphor for the process of change and transformation. Uh, wonderful also that it is the god of Dionysus, the god of transformation, of fluidity, of lack of boundaries um, uh, that is going for that transformation. So, um, but also what is you know, very interesting in this process of transformation is that Dionysus goes to the underworld. Now, if we think with our modern minds about the underworld um, is as a place of death and decay, I mean, we will go some way towards, um, you know, um, I think what I believe Frogs is trying to do. Um, in Greek imagination, um, the underworld is not only a place of death and decay, but is also at the same time and as vitally the place of regeneration of life. Okay, so life, um, when it um, it dies goes into the underworld and then, you know, and then also f uh, in the earth, but also life comes back from the earth. Um, Hades 
Um, if you, I mean, those of you who um, have maybe seen iconography, is never portrayed as the god of, I mean, of death and decay. It's in fact portrayed very often with the cornucopia, okay, the symbol of productivity, of generation, of life. Okay, so Dionysus then goes to the underworld, so goes up, goes down, undergoes a symbolic death, okay, in order to um, come up again in this um, you know, extremely, space, extremely important spatial motif of uh, down and up again of death and the regeneration. Uh, okay, so um, um, already we've given you two levels of um, you know on which you can um, you can read the frogs simultaneously. One doesn't cancel the other. Uh, there are many other levels. There is a level of poetics as well, which concerns Aristophanes and his own poetics. But perhaps we can discuss this um, uh, later. Sorry, before I finish, um, our own production is reflecting the, uh, on the fact of regeneration and change. Um, because, uh, as you can see behind me, we have the he what is eventually going to be the place of the underworld, Hades. And um, unlike a kind of a modern representation of underworld, this is a place where kind of growth okay, comes from. So very much reflecting on the idea of regeneration and growth. Okay, so um, um, Tof, um, uh, how, impo how important do you think, I mean, on your, um, on your reading you know, of, of the frogs, um, do you think, um, uh, that um, a Greek comedy is always to be read politically. I, I think it is to be read politically, but I don't want to limit it to that. Okay. I'm going to say, I uh, come on in. Oh. <laughs> uh, so one of the things about the play is how very literate it is. Um, we only have a small fraction of the comedies that survive, uh, a, 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 a small fraction of the comedies that were written, there were other Dionysus plays before this one. Dionysus had starred in a number of comedies, and so the choice to have him in this immediately makes those associations for members of the audience. They may have seen other plays where characters go to the underworld, and other playwrights also wrote about these themes, and the coming together of a number of particular comedies uh, including Cretinus's Dionys Alexandros uh, and, 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 and plays by Eupolis, but the awareness of the awareness of other poets engaging with these themes um, is something that we, we really sort of struggle to come to terms with. We see has everyone read the play? Does everyone sort of know how it ends? I don't, if, if, is this going to be a, a surprise ending for anyone? If it's going to be a surprise ending for you, put up your hand right now and I'll be very careful. Okay, good. I won't, thank you for doing that. So that's good. So we won't talk about some things. Um, <laughs> very useful. But there's going to be two tragic playwrights on stage. And one of them is a playwright from 50 years before, the playwright Aeschylus, who had written the Oresteia. We've got six of his plays, maybe seven, six of his plays surviving today. Um, and he represents the older generation of playwrights, and there's expectations for the greatest works of literature from the previous generation. And in any artistic medium, there are the people who founded and established that medium, and that's what Aeschylus represents. The other tragedian that we see on stage is Euripides, and Euripides had died just the previous year. He was an old man at this point, but he still represented um, someone who was bringing novelty and innovation and reacting against that. Aristophanes appreciates both of them. Aristophanes was the most, we've got a whole bunch of plays of Euripides as well. We've got 18 plays of Euripides surviving to us. So Aristophanes was the best reader Euripides ever got. Aristophanes understood his contemporary playwright Euripides, I think, better than anyone ever. 
And that's why the jokes at Euripides' expense are particularly funny to the academic. Now, the problem for, the produ for, for a production is making that relevant and making that communicate. And I've not asked how that communication is going to happen, because I'm going to find out this evening as well. But thinking in terms of uh, you know, the great cinematic directors of the past against the best ones of the current generation, or the best musicians of the past against the you know, the, the current music that's popular or not necessarily popular but is selling very well. Um, thinking of those generational conflicts of how inevitably new people come along and try and innovate and try and change things ties into the reading that you were providing about regeneration. Exactly. And so uh, the choice that Dionysus faces in this play is a political choice, I feel. It's <laughs> fundamentally a political choice, but it's also an artistic choice. An artistic choice. And that artistic choice and that literary choice is being filtered through comedy, and it's being filtered through the public performance of poetry. And, and, not, and not for the first time, as you say. I mean, comedy uh, is a play that is profoundly um, preoccupied with literary and art artistic production of, of its own time, especially tragedy. Um, tragedy is, is, a, is almost a, an obsession for you know, the comedy of the fifth century. So what you see, so what you will see uh, happening on the stage of the frogs, so the two you know, poets and you know, their plays kind of being brought to, to life, um, you know, almost is, is the end of a very, or the end, you know, is a, a very mature stage of a very long process of comedy engaging with tragedy um, on, on very, very many levels. And not only as satire, okay, as, um, as um, Toff um, uh, told you, um, Aristophanes is, is a very keen reader of Euripides, of Aeschylus as well, um, and his plays are um, seeped into Euripidean themes and Euripidean ideas and Euripidean tragedy, not only or, uh, you know, as satire, but also as homage there. So which is you know, very, very interesting, especially, and I'm not gonna reveal the ending of the play, but especially in the light of you know, the ending of the play. But I'm very mindful of, of time, so I would very much like to um, open the floor for questions, I mean, um, I mean, we are by ourselves, and uh, we would very much appreciate to hear what you have to say um, from your own point of view. Not only about frogs, about drama, about the role of drama in society, or whatever else you would like to, you know, convey to us or hear our opinion about. So the question is. Um, uh, if, if there's differences in how media is consumed today uh, from how it was back then, and I think obviously there are differences. We live in a society, we are exposed to so many stories. We, after seeing a play tonight, might go home and put on Netflix and have a comedy and uh, you know, a, a, t a romantic story. We just consume narratives, and we have so many narratives that are available to us on so many different, f uh, on many different formats, all of which are authorized in, in some extent. Um, while, of course, storytelling existed uh, in informal and formal ways in antiquity, the prominence of the dramatic festivals in Athens is something that really uh, does sort of elevate uh, these stories above the other ones. The Athenians knew that their plays were good. This was a major cultural export already at the time of this play. Um, they were shipping it to colonies. Actors would be reperforming plays, um, as, as we were in just the, talking about. Yes, in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Across the Mediterranean. But I think we don't realize how privileged we are to be exposed to so many stories. So in some sense, there's a lot more uh, signal uh, or a lot more noise that we have to cut through in order to get to signal. We're also uh, more skilled, let's say, at reading through 
uh, multiple narratives and, and seeing analogies. But on the same point, we, we lack the experience um, and the, the, the use of memory, for example, in terms of being able to recollect previous performances from five, ten years ago. There are half a dozen moments uh, that sort of have seared into my brain uh, from theater experiences that I've been to in the past, but I'm astounded at the literacy or the, the expectation of intimate familiarity that these plays expect of their audiences. They trust their audiences completely in a way that I think uh, modern directors or at least modern producers don't always do. We, you know, we, we apologize for them or we put in footnotes one way or the other, but but the Athenians really trusted that their audiences were going to get it. And uh, I mean, um, and also, um, I mean, as we see from, I mean, comedy reflects very much the kind of contemporary, you know, popular views. And as we see, and you will see also from uh, the Frogs itself, how um, audiences, at least, I mean, contemporary audience did believe that art changes society. And in fact, this is a point where comedy antagonizes tragedy, okay? Tragedy now, at this point, is the major overwhelming cultural phenomenon. Um, I mean, there is a, a belief that it influences, you know, people's thought, people's education, the way of, the way of thinking. And comedy, um, as it, you know, as it loves to do, puts tragedy down and puts itself up and says, no, actually, comedy you know, can influence you in better directions than tragedy. So there's other, there's plays, frogs, but there's other plays as well that, you know, put tragedy down for this. But there is an awareness that art can change society, yes. I hope that answers you a little bit. Okay, so uh, the, the question, the first two characters you're going to meet are the god Dionysus and his slave. And I have to tell you, someday someone's going to cast me as Xanthius because <laughs> I love that role so much. Um, it is. Director, it is. <laughs> um, but the master slave duality, uh, boss, employee, uh, is, is something that it doesn't take very much. Uh, imagination to find parallels with all through the history of comedy. Um, and I think that uh, part of the joy of that relationship between those two characters is that the slave, the one who doesn't have rights in society, has the ability to talk back and to usurp against his master. So in some senses it's a Jeeves and Worcester uh, relationship where the slave has um, skills that the master lacks, um, but it's also just funny that a god needs to have a slave, um, the fact that he's not able to do everything on his own. Um, the Dionysus in this play uh, sort of struggles to get on with a lot of really basic things, and he's not the bravest fellow, and he's, he, he sort of misses the fact that he's immortal. Um, he keeps forgetting that, um, and that's, that's part of the humor, but uh, the the universality of that master-slave relationship, for me, is really emblematized in their relationship almost from the very first lines. Absolutely, I completely agree. <laughs> These are great questions about the chorus. The chorus is very, very exciting. Um, I'm going to start with the second question first, um, and that is that if... Uh, these plays are exported, they are going to have used local choruses. Perhaps the actors will have taken the script uh, with them and perhaps they will have trained, uh, uh, they, they, they will have taken the director to, uh, to train a local chorus, but it's, they're, they're not shipping uh, the chorus of 24 with them um, unless they're also coming as rowers on the boat to do so. Um, but the comic chorus is central to the experience of Aristophanic comedy. 24 singers and dancers on stage. It's two, two tragic choruses in one. Like they, the, the sense of um, excess and energy and beauty. I've got bad vision. And so, frankly, you're now all a blur. <laughs> and assuming that I wasn't eaten by a wild lion or something like that in antiquity, if I were going to the theater, what I would have seen most, what would have stood out for me most, is the movements of the chorus. Um, I really th think in terms of uh, 
thinking in terms of a football game isn't a completely silly uh, parallel. When you sit, sit back in the stands and you watch um, you know, a team advance, you know, they move like a flight of birds, but they're moving like a chorus. They are aware of each other and they're moving in that sense. So your first question now is how they were chosen. Um, chorus, uh, we don't know, but we've got little hints of evidence here and there. So uh, we know that um, in the democracy, every male citizen was assigned to one of 10 tribes um, and the tribes were composed of various villages. Uh, there's a few inscriptions that let us believe that uh, in addition to the dithyrambic competitions, these singing choruses where there were 50 men or boys which were definitely organized by tribe, um, that that same level of organization could have been brought down uh, lower down, uh, or to, to the tragedies and comedies. Um, we've got one inscription, for example, that uh, records a victorious chorus. Euripides was directing it, and we only have the first names of the people. We don't have their father's names, and we don't have their deem or tribe. So the assumption is that they were all from the same group. Whether that was usual or not in this particular case, and it's the monument of Socrates of Anagyrus, which is in, uh, I can give you a reference for it later if you want, um, but we've got uh, Socrates was the producer, Euripides directed, and here are 14 names of the choristers. Does that mean there were only 14 in the chorus? Maybe the rest just didn't get written down. It, this is how they celebrated that victory. It's stunning. We don't know the plays that won. We don't know the year. <laughs> we don't know, you know, all we know is that the, we don't know the actors. So if you think of, the, they've just announced the, the latest Oscar nominations. Um, we know who the best director was, but we don't know the screenplay, we don't know the name of the best picture, and we don't know the best actors, supporting actors, or any of those things, but we do know the chorus, and that shows the centrality of the chorus for the life of comedy. Yes, there's the individuals, but the plays called the frogs, or it's called the clouds, or it's called the Acarnians, or it's called the women of Trachis, it's called the Trojan women. All these plays have chorus names because the chorus is central. So I believe that they could be limited by deem, they, but it's that's a call really of not the didaskalos, not the director, but of the choregos. Um, so the person who's paying the taxes in order to fund this, and I do think uh, asking the richest people in society to fund the arts is a brilliant tax <laughs> system. Um, the choregos is working with the director and he's going to have made choices that might privilege his deem or his tribe um, or they're gonna bring in ringers. Uh, and we've got stories from the fourth century of people trying to pass off non-citizens as if they were citizens because yeah. they've got a really nice voice or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. So I hope that, there because, we go. Yeah, because the, the chorus members have to be citizens, whereas actors don't have to be citizens. They can be foreigners. I mean, you, you import, you know, you import a good actors, but the chorus, the voice of the city has to be, you know, uh, has to comprise um, citizens. Uh, I'm not going to answer that question, but I will tell you, I've already told you that I want to play Xanthius. Um, the roles get doubled in the ancient theater. And, and thinking about doublings and how those plays, uh, how those doublings work and how they reinforce choices um, that are made uh, is interesting. And the way the play splits, we don't see Xanthius once we see the playwrights, which means that the Xanthius actor is playing either Aeschylus or Euripides. And both of them make sense. And after the first production, a different director might make a different choice. But if it's me, <laughs> and I get to cast myself, I'm casting myself not as Dionysus. Dionysus is a straight man. I want to be Xanthius. And then I want to play Aeschylus. Yes. And I'm going to tell you why. Yes. There's one moment where uh, they're making fun of each other's music. And the way a punchline works, the way a joke works, you need a setup 
and then you come in with the punchline. And so Euripides makes fun of Aeschylus' music. That's the setup. And then the punchline is when Aeschylus gets to come on and sing in the style of Euripides, in this newfangled style. And that, for me, is the sweetest moment of theater in this play. It's I, not... I'm uh, sorry, sorry, I think we've... We've, we've cut we've that cut line. <laughs> <laughs> but we... <laughs> but, no, but, no, but, but I was just about to say, but every production makes different choices. Okay, yes, exactly, and so, exactly. So, so, and so, yes. so, so, so that's, that's my answer, and I think you can deduce my answer maybe from that. Um, but uh, I want to play Xanthius and Aeschylus. And in my case, I agree. But I, again, I have, we have different uh, um, in rationale here. If you want a regeneration, if you want you know, real growth, you know, if you want the, the city to grow back, then if you have one poet who is obsessed with the powers of nature uh, throughout his place, and then you have another poet who is perceived to be as, you know, very technical, experimental, and kind of very bookish, and very kind of well-read, which one of the two are you going to pick? I mean, I'm going to pick Aeschylus because I think nature, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated with nature in Aeschylus's place. But I mean, I, I mean, the answer uh, in my, the interpretation is a lot more complex than that. But I think on this point, because, um, yeah. We've got to let the actors prepare. Exactly. But thank you all very much for coming tonight. Um, I hope you really enjoyed the show. I know I'm looking forward to it a great deal. Uh, I'm going to be standing outside if you want to say hi or yeah. get an inscription reference or something like that. <laughs> I'm always happy to give inscription references. You have it on you now. Um, but no, this, this was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.